Welcome to the annual Dr. Abdul Qayyum Lodi Memorial Lecture on Human Rights, presented by the Atlantic Human Rights Center and St. Thomas University. I'm Dr. Shannon Brooke Murphy, Acting Director of the Atlantic Human Rights Center. As you will see throughout this event, your microphone and camera will be switched off, but we still want to hear from you. Our featured speaker, Professor John Boros, will answer questions following his lecture. We encourage you, therefore, to submit any questions that you may have by using the Q&A box located in the Zoom toolbar at the bottom of your screen. And you can also pre-submit questions at any time, either before or during the lecture. I'd like also to remind all of our panel participants to please keep your microphones muted and your cameras switched off when you are not speaking. And I will remind you both to unmute uh, and turn your camera back on as you are ready to begin your portion of the program. We acknowledge that St. Thomas University is situated on the unsurrendered and unceded territory of the Wallastiqui Nation. This evening, we are honored by the presence of St. Thomas University elder in residence, Migmahan, who not only supports our Indigenous students, but also acts as a link between the university and local First Nations communities. Migmahan is a Wabanaki Mi'kmaq grandmother of the Fish Clan from Eskinupidij. Her life has been devoted to Wabanaki cultural revival and promoting an understanding of indigenous matriarchal systems. Migmahan teaches grandmother teachings on the stages of life, on human development cycles, and cultural history and ceremonial roles and practices in women and men, drawing uh, on Wabanaki languages uh, as references. So I now invite Migmahan to switch on her camera and microphone and to formally open this event with a traditional welcome. So, um, thank you very much, Dr. Shannon Brooke Murphy. And um, it's uh, truly a, uh, an honor tonight to offer Thanksgiving on behalf of our presentation uh, this evening. Uh, and so I will begin on Chigisuk. Tijahamijina, Jeniska Mijina, me wedam dandeli gan muyeg, Nimajuahan, me wedam dandeli, igan muyeg, Malki ginodi, dandeli, mawali, yak miguel, wellag, agno de madultinen, a habajimi wede de mene, die, de la mugubin, de lia hawel, begisu die gubin, gungi giminach, uchit niadaglida, dandeli unahad of desnen, unahad desnen. Geluk Mima Johan, Geluk Kalanuega deal, Habajulia, Ulai, Namsagoi, and Kidno Mahamigo Sitham. In my uh, mother tongue, I've expressed gratitude and to our Creator, to all our ancestors, uh, and all of creation uh, for the light that's been gifted to us. Uh, the ancestral teachings and uh, the natural law and uh, how we've been guided as humanity here to live in harmony and in balance with all of creation. And uh, um, again, uh, grateful for the opportunity to extend those thanksgivings, acknowledging all the life forces that has given good life to all of us. And we continue to look towards our ancestral knowledge uh, to stay of good mind and to continue our life's work here to, um, to raise human consciousness and return the good life that was given to us in the beginning times. Thank you again. Have a wonderful evening. I will get, get back to you, Shannon. Thank you, merci. Waliwan, walalim, Mikmahan for getting us started on the right foot. At this time, I'd like to invite Dr. Kim Fenwick to switch on her camera and microphone uh, and to say a few words of welcome 
not only in her principal capacity as St. Thomas University's Vice President Academic and Research, but also as Chair of the Senate Committee on Reconciliation and as Vice Chair of the Atlantic Human Rights Centre Advisory Board. Thank you, Dr. Murphy. Good evening, everyone. I'm pleased to welcome Dr. John Boros, the Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Law at the University of British Columbia to St. Thomas University this evening. The inspiration for this annual lecture, Dr. Abdul Lodi was a distinguished scholar and human rights advocate who co-founded the Atlantic Human Rights Centre. He would be astounded at the range of subjects this lecture series has addressed. Past speakers have spoken on disarmament, racial profiling, poverty, 9-11, and the Syrian conflict. He would also be amazed at the growth of our human rights program. STU is one of the few universities in Canada that offers an undergraduate program in human rights. Our department chair, Dr. Amanda DiPaolo, is a winner of the Association of Atlantic Universities Distinguished Teacher Award. Dr. Christina Shirley is a specialist in international human rights law. And our endowed chair in human rights, Dr. Shannon Brooke Murphy, has two decades of experience in human rights policy. These professors offer our students outstanding learning opportunities. Just a few examples of what is happening this semester is noteworthy. Ashley Thornton and Emily Green were crowned winners of the North American Stetson Environmental Law Moot Court, and they have qualified for the international round in April. Coming soon, STU students are participating in the Osgoode Canadian Constitutional Law Moot Court and the International Space Moot. Coming soon, Stu, uh, participants, Stu students will be participating also in the Osgood Canadian Constitutional Law Moot Court um, in Toronto. Other students are currently part of a national project examining local human rights issues in the context of international law. The project is led by Alex Neve, former Secretary General of Amnesty International Canada. In addition to our professors and unique programming, I know that our students are inspired by the quality of the guest speakers we are able to attract. Knowing the work of Dr. Burroughs and knowing its importance to Canada tonight will be no different. So welcome Dr. Burroughs and all of those watching online. Dr. Murphy, back to you. Thank you, Dr. Fenwick for your generous welcome and for your ongoing work uh, in support of the Atlantic Human Rights Center. And on behalf of the Atlantic Human Rights Centre, I just want to say a few brief words about tonight's program. First, of course, we are deeply honoured by and most grateful to and frankly rather excited about our featured speaker, Professor John Boros, for taking time out of his very busy schedule to give tonight's lecture. We are likewise grateful to our Chancellor, the Honourable Graydon Nicholas, for agreeing to formally introduce our guest speaker and to moderate tonight's discussion. Many thanks though are also due to the generous and essential behind the scenes support of Brianna Bourgeois, who is the staffer at the Atlantic Human Rights Center, Jeffrey Carlton, who is St. Thomas University Vice President of Communications and Jacqueline Cormier from the communications team, as well as of course, Michael McCracken, McCracken for his technical support uh, of this virtual lecture. All these contributions are what made this evening's event possible. Of course, in a time of pandemic-induced online meeting fatigue, I thank each and every one of you who joined us this evening in our audience, who has taken the time and the effort uh, to join us for this special event. Your presence is especially appreciated. So in a few moments, I will be introducing this evening's moderator, and he in turn will introduce our featured guest speaker. Following uh, Professor Boros's presentation, there will be time for questions and answers, which you may submit at any time using the Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen, as I said earlier. Your submitted questions uh, will be received and directed to Professor Boros by our moderator, Chancellor Nicholas. And finally, we will finish up this evening's event with the presentation of this year's Atlantic Human Rights Centre Award for Excellence in Human Rights. Our moderator for tonight is St. Thomas University Chancellor, the Honourable Graydon Nicholas, and I can think of no one better suited for this task, not only because of his familiarity with our guest speaker's body of work, 
not only because of the decades of leadership he has provided within the Indigenous rights movement here in New Brunswick, but also because he is a fellow teacher of human rights here at St. Thomas University within the Native Studies program. Chancellor Nicholas is a distinguished and highly respected Wallastiqui elder, lawyer, judge, social worker, and activist, originally from Tobik First Nation. He served as the appointed 30th Lieutenant Governor of New Brunswick. He is not only the first Indigenous person to hold that office, but also the first to be appointed as a provincial court judge and the first in Atlantic Canada to obtain a law degree. He is a member of the Order of New Brunswick and of the Order of Canada. Earlier in his career, Chancellor Nicholas was chair of the board and president of the Union of New Brunswick Indians, also acting as their legal counsel in the landmark Supreme Court treaty recognition case, Simon versus the Queen. And he participated in the Geneva meetings, advocating for the development of what became the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. He holds honorary degrees from four universities, acts as an advisor to the UNB Faculty of Law, and remains as endowed chair in Native Studies here at St. Thomas University. So I now hand over the proceedings to our moderator, the Honourable Graydon Nicholas, and invite him to switch on his camera and his microphone. Thank you, Graydon. Uh, well, good evening, and thank you very much for that nice introduction, uh, Dr. Murphy. And it's my pleasure, of course, to introduce uh, a wonderful man, a wonderful person who's, in my view, very br brilliant uh, for our uh, Indigenous and legal communities throughout this land. Dr. John Burroughs, of course, has the degrees of MA, BA, JD, LLM from Toronto, and a PhD from Osgoode Hall Law School. He's got honorary degrees from four universities and is highly uh, respected for his writings. Some of his writings are Recovering Canada, the Resurgence of Indigenous Law in 2002. Another one is Freedom and Indigenous Constitutionalism in 2016, and in the Resurgence and Reconciliation in 2020, all of which he was recognized and received awards. On top of that, he's also received the award in 2017 of the Killam Prize in Social Sciences, and in 2019, the Molson Prize winner for, for Canada Council of the Arts Grant. He is uh, also an officer of the Order of Canada in 2020. He's a member of the Chippewa of Nawish First Nation in Ontario, Canada. Now, having said his uh, credentials academically and all that, I just want to give you a little bit of what he has done also uh, to bring about uh, a resurgence in Indigenous identity, particularly in the law. In his career to date, he's taught more than 400 Aboriginal law students across Canada and brought Indigenous legal perspectives to thousands of non-Aboriginal students and I must say also law professors who have taken their sabbaticals to spend some time at the University of Victoria and learn from him. But he also created many first himself. He created the Aboriginal law at the University of Toronto. He was the first academic director of the First Nations Legal Studies at the University of British Columbia. And he founded the intensive program in lands, resources and First Nations at the Osgoode Hall Law School. On top of that, he also taught in Akalaqui, Nunavut, at uh, Akitsarak, where the University of Victoria reached out to as a satellite campus to, the, to, the, to Nunavut. And his words were this in describing his experience. It's, a, it's the closest thing in North America to an Aboriginal law school. I am grateful to be associated with the University of Victoria in this venture. It doesn't stop there. I just want to make one more final comment on what he has done because he's very busy at the University of uh, Victoria Law School. He created a proposal for an unprecedented four-year program to work earn a dual Indigenous law common law degree, which was launched in September 2018 of the Canadian common law, JD, and also Indigenous legal orders 
a joint degree program with UVic, the first of its kind in the world. And also in 2017, John was in fact honored as a recipient of a National Aboriginal Achievement Award in light of all of his qualifications. So with no further ado, I would like to ask my friend, John, to begin his lecture and thank you very much. Miigwech. Bujun na dinawe magani dok, ni jinishnabe nich marzik, bangie to go ninita nishnabe, and guguji tun jishnamayan. A giganos and dishnakas, ne ashi wenigaming and don jaba, and gigan do dem. Grateful to have this invitation to speak with you this evening and to have these wonderful introductions. I appreciate the invitation that I've received from the Atlantic Human Rights Center and St. Thomas University to be a part of uh, these events this evening. Also grateful for that prayer and for that wonderful introduction from Chancellor Nicholas. He's really an inspiration to us across the land and uh, so grateful for his work. And thank you, Dr. Fenwick, for your kind words as well. I want to acknowledge uh, Dr. Lodi for this uh, lecture and putting us into this place to be able to talk about human rights. And today I wanna to talk about human rights in a broad perspective, in particular about the resurgence of Indigenous law. And so I'll speak for about 30, 35 minutes, and then we'll have an opportunity to uh, have questions and answers with one another. And I will do this by sharing my slides here. So a second ago, Graydon said that at the University of Victoria, we have this new Indigenous law common law degree. Students come, can come to UVic and they can receive a JD, which is a common law degree, and a JID, which is an Indigenous law degree. And here on the screen before you is the opening event that took place in our big house here to launch that um, experience. We have one of the students expressing their welcome and appreciation and commitment to the program that's standing in the front. Uh, you have in the foreground elders, the university president, one of the, the minister of education in British Columbia, um, and on the other side, elders are gathered and then the students are along the wall there. And what's happening is we're able to teach indigenous law in a trans-systemic setting here at the University of uh, Victoria. And it's exciting to see that indigenous law is a part of the broader framework of what we see in, in this country in terms of guiding our affairs. So I wanna talk to you about how it is we got to that place. A moment ago, I did introduce myself in my language. I said, Nigigan Dodem. I'm of the Otter Clan. That's my family. I'm speaking to you from the Sinchothan and Lekwungen speaking people's territories here on the southern part of Vancouver Island this evening. And I want to express my appreciation to the Wallastakwuhi uh, peoples and uh, on their um, hospitality there at St. Thomas University. I also mentioned I'm from the Chippewa, the Nawash First Nation, or Neashi, Winnegaming and Don Jaba, which is about three and a half hours north of Toronto, four and a half hours north of Detroit on Georgian Bay on what's called the Saugeen or the Bruce Peninsula, as that arrow is pointing there uh, to that uh, um, part of the world. And that's where my family lives to this day. Now, when we talk about Indigenous law in Canada, it's important to recognize the diversity of Indigenous peoples. We have five uh, language families that are east of the Rocky Mountains and six west of the Rocky Mountains. And when you think about these language families, you can see some of the languages that you were spoken uh, to this evening are Gonkian languages, and they stretch from the Atlantic Ocean uh, down the Gulf of, uh, down the St. Lawrence River, across uh, Ontario, out through the prairies and over to the Rocky Mountains. So we go from the Mi'kmaq people to the Blackfoot people as we make that stretch from uh, from that group. You also know that uh, the Inuit people are circumpolar people, and then we have the Dene people, Athabascan speaking people, uh, down the Mackenzie Delta and then further south. And then finally in the east we have the Suyan people, Lakota, Dakota, Nakota, and the Iroquoian speaking people, the Haudenosaunee, Haudenosaunee uh, people of the Six Nations. What's interesting though to look at this map is you see such a diversity of languages here on the west coast. Uh, where six of those 11 families are gathered. And many of those languages are um, isolates, meaning they developed on their own uh, over 
10 to 15,000 years, and they're very distinct from the languages that just adjoin them. And while there was a trade language to go up and down the coast to help in this maritime region, what this indicates on this map is the diversity of Indigenous peoples. So when we talk about the revitalization of the resurgence of Indigenous law, this map should stand in for an appreciation that Indigenous um, reveals as much as it hides, <laughs> because Indigenous means many things in many parts of our country, and this language differentiation should signal to us cultural differences, spiritual, economic, social, um, you know, the gamut is wide. Having said that, though, we will talk about some of the similarities this evening, but those similarities occur in the background of that rich, rich, rich diversity. So now when we talk about laws, it's important to recognize that laws don't just come from legislatures and ministers of the crown enforced by sort of executive arms of the state, maybe interpreted by the courts. Laws, of course, do come from legislatures, the executive and the judicial branch, but laws also come from us. Uh, we are ourselves legal practitioners as we have to receive and make law in our democratic context. And for Indigenous peoples, it's helpful to think about the functional perspectives on law. For Indigenous peoples, if you don't see legislatures or courts or executive branches, that doesn't mean that there's no Indigenous law, because what you find is Indigenous peoples creating standards, principles, processes, criteria, measures, indicia, benchmarks, precedents, guides, that is, we, we have as Indigenous peoples intellectual and cultural resources for regulations, rules, and codes. In other words, we have these um, functions for making decisions and resolving disputes. And so if you think about law in a functional way, uh, what, what, are, what do Indigenous peoples do to make decisions? They don't just do this arbitrarily, ad hoc, chaotically. There's patterns attached to decision making, to dispute resolution, and those patterns are there because of the principles and processes and criteria and measures and guides and et cetera. And this is really important and we're, when we're talking with one or another this evening, because the resurgence of Indigenous law, the revitalization of Indigenous law is bringing to the fore uh, many of these uh, points, uh, many of these standards and processes to help not only with their own affairs, but also to help in their relationships with those around them. And so that's the uh, frame that we're operating in here. Now, as we think about uh, that, I'm going to give you some examples, moving more from sort of an internal view to eventually a more external view of how Indigenous law has had and continues to have an impact on our lives. Here on the West Coast, there's this feasting tradition known as the potlatch. Uh, a potlatch uh, might take place over a number of days, and in the big hall that you see before you here with all these beautiful carvings around uh, you, these carvings representing many of the um, ancestors of the territory, the chiefly names of the territory, the lessons that people have learned in that territory. People will come into this hall and they will want to transact business. They'll want to adopt a child or confirm a marriage or um, um, create an opportunity for a commercial op, um, activity or confirm a, a land area, a title area within land, or um, and, uh, um, assume or carry out a, a chiefly responsibility by perhaps getting a name. And so in this big house, people will assemble for those purposes to create law, like you know, family law and commercial law and constitutional law, um, et cetera. But they will do so, um, again, not by reading out from statutes, but they will put on button blankets with beautiful masks and, and they will dance around these fires. And in those settings, what they will do is they will set out what their precedent is for how they should be conducting, conducting their, their affairs. Um, in other words, law can be danced, it can be sung, it, it can be embodied as, uh, as through an entire day, you kind of have the chronicling of the precedent uh, the tradition, the authority of uh, these peoples as to how they're going to uh, affirm and make these decisions as I've just described. 
Now, as this goes on uh, around that fire, if there's a dispute about an issue, um, there can be an intervention in that dispute and there can be an opportunity to problem solve in that way. Also, as the business is transacted, as the decisions are made and affirmed, there's witnesses that are called. And those witnesses also are an important part. If there's a dispute in the future, they can come back and speak to uh, what can be done to um, address that dispute. Now, the potlatch that I went to um, uh, recently, um, just before COVID, was the fourth of a series of four potlatches put on by Chief Wanuk. And in that potlatch, he spent $40,000 uh, to be able to bring together the people and the, the food and the meals as a part of that. And this was his fourth potlatch. And so you can think 40,000 times four at great personal expense, trying to ensure that the, the law, the order, the opportunities for certainty were created in this setting. And so at the end of the potlatch, what that $40,000 does is it pays for a feast where everyone can enjoy each other's company and discuss the events, not only the potlatch, but more generally in the community to help create a community glue, I guess you'd say, between the different people that are there. And then also as associated with that feast, there'll be a giving away of, of blankets and masks and all sorts of material goods to create a reciprocity between the community and the people, the chief that has put on this business. And so this is an example of an old tradition that continues today, that there was an attempt to outlaw it during the um, Indian Act uh, periods from 1884 to 1951. This was made illegal. People went underground, but they kept these traditions alive. And, uh, and so you have them today as a part of their legal order. It's also the case though that people are taking these practiced, customary, uh, implied traditions and they're putting them into written form. So here's an example from Anishinaabe constitutionalism. Again, that's the nation that I'm a part of and the Anishinaabe are in Quebec and Ontario, Manitoba, Saskatchewan. We're also in Michigan, Wisconsin and Minnesota and North Dakota. There's a lot of folks that call themselves Anishinaabe which is Ojibwe, Potawatomi, Odawa, around the Western Great Lakes. So in our constitutions, we take these unwritten principles and we put them into written form. You have an example of a preamble here that's appearing in some 20 to 30 constitutions across uh, Anishinaabe country in Ontario. And then these kind of values and laws also appear in the US context with their constitutions and their tribal courts that you'll find in that setting as well. And I want to point out to you uh, in the middle of this, um, maybe I'll just read it to you, the whole thing here. Ningo Dwe Wan Gazette Anishinaabe, one Anishinaabe family. The Banja Gade Gisan Anishinaabe King Gibbon Gaden Manadu Wadizuan. Creator placed the Anishinaabe on the earth along with the gift of spirituality. Shkode Nibi Aki Noden Gibbe Gursunun We Nagandwe Demong Mom Pishikami Kong. Here on Mother Earth, there were gifts given to the Anishinaabe to look after fire, water, earth, and wind. That is, the Creator also gave the Anishinaabe seven sacred gifts to guide them. They are Zigidwin, Debuewin, Manandain Damuin, Nabuakawin, Dabadain Dizwin, Kwekwazuin, Minwa Akadewin. Love, truth, respect, wisdom, humility, honesty and bravery. Creator gave us sovereignty to govern ourselves. We respect the and honor the past, present and future. Now this might not appear to be the kind of preamble that you would be familiar with. Canada's constitution says um, that it's similar in principle to Great Britain's, and it's created for the purposes of peace, order, and good government. That's our 1867 constitution. Our 1982 constitution, which adds to our 1867 constitution, says Canada is founded on the supremacy of God and the rule of law. Well, here what the Anishinaabe people have done is just taken other starting points that can be consistent with peace, order, and good government, the supremacy of God and the rule of law, but they're different words that are chosen that are rooted in the ecologies of the places where we live. 
And notice these ideas of love, truth, respect, wisdom, humility, honesty, and bravery. You might ask, how can those things be law? Aren't they too vague or ambiguous? Um, aren't they too general to be able to set as legal standards? And there's no doubt that there are high aspirations. And there's no doubt that there's a big scope that's wrapped up in those uh, words. But if we remember in Canadian constitutionalism, we also have these kinds of aspirations, life, liberty, security, equality, freedom, or as I mentioned a second ago, peace, order, good government, rule of law, right? Those are also broad, vague, ambiguous, but through time they've been given meaning as people have worked in relationship to them to interpret them in specific contexts. And that's what Anishinaabe and other people do when they're taking their language and they're taking their laws uh, that might seem to be uh, general. Um, they um, are just a different target, but a, a target that's harmon harmonizable, if that's the word, with uh, other Canadian laws. These are things that people are familiar with in broader um, language, you know, love, truth, respect. Although the difference is they're, because they're rooted in our language, so you see love there is Zigitawin, um, love actually refers to river mouths. And so if we wanna learn about love, we look to a river mouth and we see what a river mouth has to teach us about that principle. And so it is with many of our legal concepts, um, Anishinaabemuin, uh, like uh, the Algonquian languages there are, verb-oriented languages, 70% verbs. They're um, polymorpheme uh, languages. In other words, the sounds of the language often have some correlations with activities that take place in the physical world around us. And so we can learn about love or truth or respect from looking at the physical world around us and drawing analogies from that as the case might be. And so that constitution making, although it's written down, actually refers to a specific physicality of a territory in the earth. And of course, it comes along with a lot of other stories and values and ideas to support it as it's being implemented. The Anishinaabe system itself is a clan-based system. You see here, this is a treaty document that was signed in 1855 that was communicated by the Ojibwe, in this case, to Washington, um, the, the government at Washington, as the, the groups here have their hearts joined together, the different family groups, the different political um, um, groups have their hearts joined together. And then those hearts also connect to, uh, to one another. And then you see all the eyes are connected to the crane. Um, and then the crane sends the message along to uh, Washington at that point. The, the point to make here is this: these clan systems are systems of deliberation and persuasion and counseling with one another and talking with one another, recognizing we have differences of opinion. And part of the revitalization, the resurgence of Indigenous law is to recognize the diversity within a particular First Nation and allow for that uh, disagreement, but to find ways that that disagreement can be processed in a way that we can still agree with one another um, in the broader sense of the word. And so just like the Canadian legal system has, you know, majority parties in parliament and minority parties or in courts, we have a, a majority judgment and an assenting judgment. So in uh, Indigenous law, you often have differences of opinion, um, dissentings and majorities. But what happens is that the counseling together process helps to generate uh, standards, principles, authority, criteria, uh, principles, guideposts, measures, benchmarks, resources for making decisions, resolving our disputes, regulating our affairs. You see this come into place in a contemporary way with here the Skeetchison and uh, um, uh, to Kamloops people um, meeting to discuss a development that was proposed on their territory, a mine. And they said, do we want this mine in our territory or not? And, uh, and so part of their organization and considering whether or not to accept that opportunity is they, they gather together as elders and youth and family, families, and they do that, that in council. And those, that's the outer ring that you see and how they visualized uh, making their law in that regard. So families come together in that clan-like way. But then on the internal circle there, you see the subjects of their conversation, um, health, the sky world, fauna, flora, fisheries, the water world, indigenomics. And as these clans, these families, 
these political communities engage on these subjects, you know, they, of course, they hear from scientists and they hear from the proponents, the corporations that are proposing the developments in their midst. They're also, you know, talking with uh, other people to, to deliberate with one another, to persuade one another about whether or not they should take this action, given sort of a cost benefit analysis. What's the impact uh, going to be that could be negative? What's the impact that could be positive? And how do we work that through? Again, using indigenous law, using their standards, principles, criteria, measures, benchmarks, authority for regulating their affairs and resolving their disputes. And in this particular case, uh, these people have accepted mines in some instances where they felt the impact could be mitigated and limited. And they've rejected mines in other cases where they thought the impact could not be mitigated on the other parts of the things that they're interested in. And so, you know, it's not just a yay or nay, it, it's, it's, it's an it depends. And it depends on Indigenous law in that instance. And you see these things happening from coast to coast to coast as corporations come to Indigenous territories and there might be Aboriginal title, treaty rights involved. And then so you get uh, Indigenous people stepping forward with what their framework is for entering into negotiations and entering into uh, discussions with corporations and governments and others that may surround them. Here's an old example of that occurring that comes from uh, 1764. In 1763, you may remember there was a seven years war between France and Great Britain. At the end of that war, the French were considered defeated because of what happened on the Plains of Abraham. And so the British made claims to North America, uh, but much like out there in the Maritimes, just because the British were making claims doesn't necessarily mean that they have the right to the lands that they were making claims over. And so what happened was a royal proclamation was given by King George III that said all the lands that Aboriginal peoples have in North America will be unmolested and undisturbed. That is the Indians lands will, be, uh, will remain with them. And if there's going to be a transfer of those lands, it has to occur in a public process, a treaty process, local colonial governments cannot enter into this treaty process, it has to be the more distant imperial government that does it. And so in 1763, that document was put out to try to recognize Indigenous lands and a treaty process in relationship to those lands. And then in 1764, um, 2,000 uh, Indigenous peoples gathered over two months at Niagara, exchanged 84 wampum belts. Wampum is shell that's sewn into hides. And you see examples of them here before you. And on those hides are images. And with those images, it indicates what the parties agreed to uh, during those treaty negotiations. So in 1764, as Canada was forming in the center part of the country with these 24 different nations, what was agreed to was that people would link arms together. That is that they would help one another. So you've got that boat over there on the the, uh, the right-hand side, that if Indigenous peoples needed help there, they would just pull on that rope of the boat and the people would come to shore and offer aid. And likewise, if the British needed help, they would also pull on that rope and we would come across uh, to them and give that aid. And you see it's accordion-like as these nations have their arms linked together to help one another in a reciprocal way going back and forth. There's also another belt here. You see where my arrow is pointing. This um, is the two-row wampum belt. You see two purple rows that are parallel and three white rows. Um, the two purple rows represent our rivers of life. And one of those rivers of life is the crown and its ship of state controlling its affairs. And then you have indigenous peoples on their river of life and their canoe controlling their affairs. And so there's a nation to nation relationship that's talked about in these times between indigenous peoples and the crown. But it's not just a separation, a measured separation. It's also in the context of a continued integration and continued working together because the most dominant motif in the belt is the white rose, peace and friendship and respect, right? That is the people were to live together with one another in peace and friendship and respect, even as there's these differentiations amongst them. These 84 wampum belts, um, if you put them beside the Royal Proclamation, give you a sense of how our country was formed with Indigenous law as a part of the way we frame out our relationship. And I know the same thing took place there on the Atlantic uh, coast and in the provinces that are now there with regard to the peace and friendship treaties that uh, took place over many, many decades in the um, um, 1700s.
So these laws now uh, that help to far, form our nation are being revitalized as uh, they're coming back into our, our, our contemporary um, um, order. So here's an example of a modern treaty. This is a picture of the Niska Lism's government. The Niska people live in the northwest part of the province of British Columbia in the Skeena River uh, watershed. And they signed a treaty that's, you know, like five, 600 pages, has 24, I don't know, 24, 26 different heads of power uh, to deal with affairs of governance and also to relate to their lands. But the way that they organize their governments is they've taken their clan structures, their house structures as represented here on the poll before you, and they've um, a blend of them with a, a parliamentary form of government, a Westminster form of government. So it doesn't have to be a contradiction to think about a legislative form and a clan-based form. Here they've intermingled them together and the, the Niska government speaks to this Lissom's government, uh, which takes the clans, the Wilps, the house groups, and then they, they um, um, you know, use many of the things that you would be familiar with when you see a legislative session or a parliamentary session. When I was teaching at the University of Toronto about 20 some odd years ago, and this government was being set up, one of my students was given the opportunity to write, actually rewrite the Roberts Rules of Order for these legislative spaces, but rewrite them in a way that would be attentive to and facilitative of a NISCA law. So the NISCA principles of order that would help to ensure that that parliament was working properly, that Lis Lism's government is working property, properly. And so that's what can happen in a treaty context. Sometimes you get legislation that recognizes the same thing. Here is the West Bank First Nation in the interior of British Columbia. You can see through this legislation that there's many heads of power that are recognized for them. You know, membership and wills and estates and financial management and traffic and transportation and public works and agriculture and culture and language. The point being that Parliament sometimes will recognize without negotiation the uh, ways that um, Indigenous peoples will take their laws, their standards, principles, authorities, and use these heads of power uh, to be able to provide for their, their communities and for their families. This band here happens to be a wealthy band because there's lots of non-Indigenous peoples living on their leased lands. And on those leased lands, they're building corporations and healthcare centers. And it's a, it's a very vibrant uh, mixing of the past with the present to try to address the future needs, not only of the West Bank people, but of all peoples that are living in that part of the world. Here's another example of legislation that Parliament passed in 2019 that uh, recognizes First Nations, Inuit, and Métis um, inherent governance over their um, family structures. Um, that is, the Aboriginal right to self-government includes rights to uh, being responsible for your children. And uh, just about a month ago, a Quebec Court of Appeal judgment affirmed that this act flows from um, inherent authority that Indigenous peoples have. It's not created, this authority is not created by the federal government or the provinces. It's recognized by the federal government and the provinces, but the source of authority is the source of authority that pre-exists um, these peoples um, encountering Canada. Those authorities have survived and they can be given modern expression through child and family services on the reserves. And it's done in, in, in Métis and Inuit communities as well. And this is done from coast to coast to coast. You also have a federal piece of legislation enacting the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. There's 46 clauses in what's called UNDRIP. And those clauses talk primarily about the rights of self-determination of Indigenous peoples. And as these, here's a provincial example of a declaration to implement the rights of, sorry, act to uh, implement the uh, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples coming from British Columbia. What's happening now is British Columbia is sitting down with First Nations and they're making, that is the province is making their laws consistent with UNDRIP, right? They're, they're having, they're drafting regulations, they're drafting legislation, they're creating action plans to ensure there's a harmonization or reconciliation between the Indigenous uh, aspirations and the aspirations that are found in 
course, the provincial and parliamentary sphere that are given the force of law in statutes and uh, executive regulations. So these are these um, points, the last four points are about legislation that is seeing the resurgence of Indigenous law. And those last four points about legislation are added to the customary and the continual way that Indigenous peoples have used their law, then entered into treaties, and then received recognition through legislation. Some Indigenous peoples have created courts in various ways with various uh, forms of engagement. There's Aboriginal title claims that are taking place across the country when Aboriginal title for instance, is recognized in British Columbia, that means that territory is no longer crown land, it's indigenous land. And as indigenous land, just like any private landowner, um, they can use that land for the purposes that they determine subject to regulation. And uh, so the process that's happening now is how does indigenous land is recognized, interact with the provincial laws that surround it. And these people are in negotiation with the federal and provincial governments to ensure that there's a harmonization in that path. Of course, there's conflict. Uh, if there's not recognition that's to the satisfaction of some parties, sometimes people blockade and occupy uh, different parts of the country saying that uh, you know, the courts haven't got to the recognition of what uh, um, is happening in other places. And so they try to move that process along in that regard. And of course, there's disagreements as to what the scope of these blockades should be, when they should be used, how they should be used, if they should be used within Indigenous communities, those disagreements are there. And of course, they're there across and beyond Indigenous communities. And what we need is to bring more law to this, right? Bring more standards, principles, authority, criteria, measures, signposts, benchmarks, uh, principles, processes that are co-created. Right, that are created by Indigenous peoples, also by the Crown, and by being co-created, they'll be pers persuasive in all of the um, places that they need to operate because they've been, they've been done by participation as opposed to unilateralism. Uh, it's occurred through uh, people talking with one another as, as opposed to just a top-down unilateral approach. This is very consistent with uh, what we hope to see, I think, in democracy, but we've got all of these challenges getting there uh, because we're still creating this framework that I'm talking to you about today. The best example of the framework though is there's about 50, 60 cases that have been decided by the Supreme Court of Canada over the last 40 years since our constitution was patriated that create a framework for reconciliation. So section 35.1 of the Constitution Act 1982 said the existing Aboriginal and treaty rights of the Aboriginal peoples of Canada are hereby recognized and affirmed. What does the court say this means? What's an existing right? What's an Aboriginal right? What's a treaty right? What's recognized? What's affirmed? They said, in order to figure this out, we have to bridge two legal cultures, the common law cultures and, and civil law cultures in Quebec, and then the indigenous cultures and laws where they are found. And those that bridging process is a process of reconciliation, reconciling indigenous laws with provincial and federal law. A case called Vanderpeet in 1996 of the Supreme Court of Canada said a morally and politically defensible conception of Aboriginal rights will incorporate both legal perspectives. And that's what the court has been trying to do over these last 40 years. A morally and politically defensible conception of Aboriginal and treaty rights will incorporate both legal perspectives. Well, you can go to law school and learn about the federal and provincial perspectives where can you learn about Indigenous legal perspectives? Well, of course, you approach the communities, they can tell you about those perspectives, but now what we're doing at UVic is also trying to create venues and avenues for those legal perspectives to also um, uh, be better understood by future practitioners and communities and governments, et cetera. There are many legal doctrines that back up this point. I don't have enough time to talk to you about them, but you know, you've got an example here, number 12, minimally impairing Aboriginal rights, or number 21, accommodation at another time, or there could be, um, let's see, number um, six, rejecting conquest and terra nullius as a foundation of Canadian law. What I'm saying here is that as communities are working to uh, revitalize their laws, and then as they're working with governments through treaties and legislation to revitalize those laws, there's also been a constitutional framework that's engaged to help facilitate that revitalization through this language of reconciliation. 
And so my work over the past 30 years is trying to write about how we can best bring some patterns of order and certainty to the way that we interact with one another and seeing our country not just as bi-juridical, not just civil law in Quebec and common law in other places, but multi-juridical, right? Indigenous law existing alongside the civil law and the common law, finding ways that those principles can be articulated in all sorts of fashions. And so I'm grateful for the opportunity I have to be able to speak about the revitalization of Indigenous law, because it's something that's happening in communities, in legislatures, in courts, and through negotiation. And as it's occurring on all of those axes, it invites our participation. Um, it's, it's about, so law is something we do, it's not just done to us. And so I'm grateful for this, uh, again, evening to be able to talk to you about these questions. And again, grateful for the opportunity to think about the strength and resilience that we see around us. And um, I look forward to questions that you might have in the remaining time that we'll share together. So miigwech bizindiweg meet you, ahau, and I'll turn it back to our moderator at this point. I'd like to invite uh, Chancellor Graydon Nich Nicholas to take over uh, the moderating responsibilities. Thank you. And thank you so much, uh, Professor Boros, for a wonderful talk. Well, thank you very much. Wow, that was, uh, uh, these are dreamed uh, lectures that I wish I had heard back in law school between 68 to 71, John. So thank you very much for that. And of course, we have questions here as well. The first question indicates that this person is halfway through their study of a JD. Uh, how would I go about working towards a JID after or during this degree? Is that a possibility? So I guess I'll let you respond to that. And uh... Yeah, so what we've been doing with this degree is we've been trying to ensure that we're not just working in a closed way, um, that we're with partners from coast to coast to coast across the country. And so I'll often go to my territories and invite students to come to my reserve and they'll spend weeks at a time. So Osgood Hall students might come for four days and enjoy learning from elders and government leaders and professors like myself from the land. And, and then the next week, it might be um, University of Toronto students that would come in. The next week after that, McGill law students would come in. And I know that same thing is happening at Western University in London and Walpole Island is doing that with um, Windsor Law School. And this is happening in UBC and other places. So there's ways that you might be able to approach your own faculty and say, we would like to learn more about the laws of these territories. Is there someone on faculty that could help to, to facilitate or create the path uh, for that to occur? Out here, the law students have been doing that for over 30 years, even before this law degree came into place, uh, there was an activity in that way. You can also learn about this work through our Indigenous Law Research Unit, ILRU, if you look that up online. And through the Indigenous Law Research Unit, you can see we're working with 43 communities. They bring questions to us about how they want to revitalize their laws, and students get involved with that, not only from UVic, from other places as well. We have summer courses in Indigenous Law that you could join. I also have all my lectures online, YouTube Law 340 is the little catch there. And you can look at those lectures in that regard if you want. Um, we also have an LLM in Indigenous Law. And so there's many opportunities to engage with Indigenous Law, not just through UVic, but also through our partnership with other law schools as well. Okay, thank you very much. And the next question is, in terms of corporations coming to Indigenous groups, to mine, et cetera, on the Aboriginal land, what role do Canadian, what role does Canadian, do Canadian governments play? Do the governments make representations as well or, or try to convince the groups that they want, that they do not want to play a larger role? Yeah, that's a great point is what does this look like in practice when there's an approach for development? And usually you have um, a, a, a provincial or a federal law that will set out an assessment process if there's um, to be an impact on the territory that could affect Aboriginal and treaty rights. And uh, that assessment process will require the engagement of different um, parts of the provincial or federal bureaucracy. And uh, they will create a study 
uh, to decide whether or not they should proceed. And then the question as to how Indigenous study relates to that study will vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. It depends on the political will of the particular government within the provinces. It depends on the legislation that they've passed. It also depends in part on the corporation and how much of a partner they feel they can be uh, with the um, First Nations Métier Inuit group in doing that. So, so the, the federal and provincial governments always have their organizing principles, and then Indigenous peoples have their organizing principles, and then how they, they relate to one another is a bit contingent. It depends on the, the jurisdiction itself that you're dealing with and the corporation that might be hoping to deal with that question in that jurisdiction. Okay, thank you. Another question it says, I am a recent immigrant to Lustigwick territory from Europe. However, the local Indigenous authorities had no input or knowledge of my residency. Shouldn't the relevant Indigenous powers have control over and input into immigration to their territory if their sovereignty as nations is to be respected? That's a great question. And the, um, what are they called? Oaths that people take when they become citizens of Canada are changing to reflect Indigenous dimensions of that. You're also having Indigenous peoples organize themselves in different parts of the country when um, these cer ceremonies are occurring or, or people are, are, are settling or resettling uh, to be able to provide some of those welcomes. But of course, as you're saying in your question, that's not happening far and wide. That's only happening in selected places right now. So part of the work ahead of us is to re-engage that diplomacy that was there in the peace and friendship treaties or in these wampum belts that I talked about to say, you know, you received a welcome through a treaty. Uh, here's what the treaty uh, principles were that uh, gave opportunities for us to interact with one another. And through the revitalization of those treaty principles or bringing those forward, people can learn as they come from different parts of the world um, what the um, local nations, laws, hopes, aspirations are to be able to create our life together that would also be respectful of um, different points of view. Okay, thank you. Next question, I wanted to ask, in what ways could the Canadian state help revitalize Indigenous laws? I think a primary way is education, <laughs> right? So I've talked a lot about the legislative provisions and the constitutional provisions and the negotiated provisions. And so the Canadian state is moving along in that pattern, but people have very little knowledge often within provinces, within the national population. It's often said that, you know, um, knowledge about Indigenous issues is a, is a mile wide and an inch deep, right? There's some surface understanding uh, about what we're talking about, but to put it further than an inch deep requires more education. And how you engage that education, of course, is multidimensional. You know, it's the arts, it's uh, it is, it's universities, it's post-secondary, it's primary schools, it's museums, it's, uh, it's, it's land territorial acknowledgements. There's just a whole raft of opportunities for these things to integrate. And when that occurs, I think that moves the agenda because again, law is something we all do. It's not just something that courts and legislatures do. And so if we're all going to do it, we all need more information about how is it that um, we are participants in our, our democracy in this regard. Okay, next question is probably because of how you explained the program at UVic. It says, can anyone apply to the UVic law program? Yes, uh, so, so what we have is a four-year degree and uh, it's two degrees, a JD and a JID, an indigenous law degree and a common law degree. Students generally will get a BA before coming to law school, which is the case from coast to coast to coast. And we invite Indigenous and non-Indigenous students to study in the program. It's cohort-based, so we accept 25 students a year, um, so that uh, in any given year, there's 100 law students out of 400 law students. So one quarter of our students are studying in this joint degree program. And uh, the kinds of criteria we look for is um, community connection, uh, interest, uh, background in some regard, um, in terms of um, you know, being able to make a contribution to the program when you come here. And uh, it's purposely Indigenous and non-Indigenous to model and mirror that reconciliation model. 
And, uh, and so, yes, you're, there's lots of information about this and other law schools that are also teaching about Indigenous law. Yeah, that's probably in the next question follow up on that. Is there any hope or ideas to create a program similar to UVIC on the East Coast? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, both the University of New Brunswick and Dalhousie have law schools. Moncton has a law school. And these initiatives, quite frankly, were created over 30 years because students demanded them. Not like with their fist raised demanded them, but they had an appetite and they had ideas. And with that appetite and ideas, they hired people like me along the way to be able to work with the students to just bring out what it is that they wanted to see with and from the communities that they were connected to. And so these things can develop locally. And I've seen them happen in other law schools as well. Um, as was mentioned, I taught at U of T and Osgood. We had initiatives there. I taught at UBC. We created a First Nations Legal Studies program there. Um, it just um, requires a little bit of, um, again, something you do. It's not just done for you. We create it together and we can create it together. We've, we've, been, we've been doing it and we'll continue to do it. It's a work okay. in progress. Thank you very much. Yeah, next one is, what seems to be the snag for the Crown not to honor the nation to nation, the treaties and the Turo Wampum mandate? So I think there's two snags. One, there's a fear, a fear about the possible consequences on the Crown if there's um, a sharing or a redistribution or a, uh, a reallocation of the way decisions are made and the resource revenues flow. There's a fear that that will take money out of the coffers that are needed for provinces to build hospitals and you know, schools and roads and et cetera, right? And, and there, so there's a worry about that. Part of, I think, addressing that worry is to recognize that Indigenous economies are bungee economies. I'm not sure if you've ever heard about bungee jumping, but by bungee economy, I mean a dollar will come into an Indigenous community, it'll hang there for a second, and it'll bounce back out, and it's spent in the surrounding communities. And so if there is a reallocation of resources or a greater sharing of opportunity with Indigenous peoples, the hope is that when that dollar comes into Indigenous communities, because the people have some further capacity, that you know it can grow as it passes from person to person to person as they purchase goods and services on the reserves. So maybe the one dollar dollar becomes five dollars or ten dollars. So then when it bounces out again, it's not just bouncing out as a dollar, right? The dollar bounces in, but it bounces out as ten dollars because you're creating the capacities uh, for decision making and dispute resolution and effective governance in a territory that is open to. Uh, finding ways to ensure that we're sustainably with one another. So I think that's the fear, but I also think there's ways to think about that fear. The other fear is just the familiarity of all of these different, like there's 11 language families that are in place. And within these language families, there's differences of opinion. People sometimes say, we can't have 500 laws across this country. Um, and that's true, uh, but it's also overstated because if you think about the frameworks that I've described that are being created, then from those frameworks, we can have some sense of what the pattern is. So, you know, there's thousands of municipalities across this country, and there's 10 provinces and three territories, and, you know, there's, there's all sorts of ways that law interacts with one another, and Indigenous law can be a part of that without getting... Um, the sense that it's just going to be impossible because of the complexity. You know, we've seen it done in, in other places, in, including in Canada. Okay, thank you very much for that, uh, John. Another one, when consultation isn't triggered via existing law, what realistic expectation is there that meaningful changes can be made? How can we advance actual meaningful consultation? Yeah, so consultation isn't always triggered because the effect on the development might not be significant enough to say that it's going to infringe an Aboriginal or a treaty right is the argument. And so what do you do in that instance? You develop relationships. Right? I think the key to this is getting to know one another, our neighbors, um, who Indigenous, non-Indigenous, uh, seeing each other in a kin-based way as brothers and sisters, uh, finding that sense of uh, we're all in this place together. And so that might sound like pie in the sky, but it's operationalized as you know, people come together 
on boards uh, or um, volunteer opportunities, uh, you know, fundraisers, uh, et cetera. I'm the, I'm the chair of the Victoria Multifaith Society. I occupy the Indigenous Spirituality Chair on that board, but I'm sitting with Hindu and Buddhist and Sikh and Jewish and Christian and other folks. We're just becoming neighbors. And that neighborliness um, spills out into other areas in our community, get called on to talk about things with the police board or you know, what's going on with the homelessness in Victoria. So in other words, relationships actually can be quite um, concrete to implement ideas of consultation, even if the formal duty is not triggered, but you need relationships to uh, have that flow. Okay. Yeah. Another question, probably following up on Yandrip, it says, what changes, if any, need to be made to our constitutional order to give effect to obligation under Yandrip? Yeah, so I want to say two things about this. One, because of this Quebec Court of Appeal decision that came out about a month ago, no changes need to be made to recognize the right to self-governance because the court said there that the right to self-governance already exists. It's a part of section 35.1 of the constitution that I've been talking to you about. An Aboriginal right that's recognized and affirmed is the right to self-governance. And so no change would be needed if that decision continues to hold, if it gets appealed to the Supreme Court of Canada. Um, and then what UNDRIP does is it comes along just like that child and family services legislation, and it creates avenues and resources for that right to be exercised, recognized and exercised with some support that surrounds it, such that it's harmonized with provincial law, harmonized with uh, other laws in the territory. So, so we, we have the tools that we already need at hand, and we're now trying to operationalize them. And what I would like to put a call out for with UNDRIP is it's not just governments, provincial and federal, that should be implementing UNDRIP. We might think about this as, our, as Indigenous communities ourselves. How can we implement UNDRIP? That is, how can we ensure that we've got a way that's protecting the employment and housing and, and land and, and, and worship practices of our own members, right? And we, and we might have that in a customary way. We might set that out in our constitutions. We might have some dispute resolution structures that help us in that regard. But, but chiefs and councils, we need more than that, right? So this idea that First Nations could implement UNDRIP would be to say to take the Mi'kmaq tradition or the Wallastokwi uh, tradition and say, how, what, what is our rights to life, liberty, security, freedom of association, and, and, and use our own language and use our own stories. And in other words, take that international principle and implement it, just as we're expecting Canada to take that inter international principle and implement it. In other words, as Indigenous peoples, we don't just need protection from the Canadian government and from the federal government, we also need protection from our own governments, right? This is all governments should find ways to strengthen their authority by limiting their authority, right? That's the kind of checks and balances of good governance that was there traditionally in our communities and needs to be revitalized in a contemporary setting because we need to protect those we love from those we love. And UNDRIP, if implemented locally by a First Nation or uh, a council of First Nations uh, could, could do some good work in helping to revitalize our own legal traditions around human rights, to say, how can we advance human rights as Indigenous peoples? Well, let's look to UNDRIP and let's implement it in accordance with our laws. Okay, thank you very much. And next one is, uh, what are some methods to include a wider population of both Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities in discussions like these? How is it possible that we include voices outside of the academic community uh, make sure uh, without invoking a top-down method? Yeah, so you know, I've seen some really good examples of this in what's called reconciliation councils. And um, before COVID, of course, they were happening much more fully. Uh, we've been really struggling, of course, over the past two years to get together. Um, but these kinds of things uh, can help that aren't just academically formulated. I've spoken to chambers of commerce um, across the country, um, those um, 
uh, the Rotary Club, for instance, uh, does some important work in the field. And I might end up speaking to 250 people, and I'm part of an ongoing series that they've had of Indigenous peoples coming into the Rotary Club to have these kinds of conversations. And so um, it just takes a couple of people in a particular place to make it happen. Let me tell you a little story. When I was a young boy, I would sit on my mother's counter and I would watch her make bread. And she'd put all the dry ingredients in there, right? The flour and the sugar and the baking soda and all these other things. And, uh, and but eventually she'd take out this little package and she'd hold this little, little grain in her hand. She said, see this? She said, this is yeast. If I put this little grain into this mix here, it's gonna make everything else rise. And I was so intrigued to watch that happen, putting that little grain in and everything else kind of took life as a result of that. And sometimes I think that's what it takes. It doesn't require the whole nation to talk about this and all be of a similar mind. We need little grains of yeast in places. When those little grains happen, it actually can cause a lot of reaction, action around them. And, uh, and so, I'm not discouraged that not everyone is involved and not everyone knows because people have complicated lives and we can't always pay attention to everything that comes before us. But those that have the energy and the hope and the information can be joined together to help with that process of putting a little bit of yeast into our communities and watch it rise wherever we find ourselves. Okay, and here's an interesting question from Mark. East Coast here, he says, in the Mi'kmaq language, we have no such words such as sovereignty or governance, but uh, there are various protocols. We have no one, no one definition of governance per se. So how do we sort this out with all of your legal training and experience? <laughs> so I think we sort it up by going to our languages. And so just because we don't have the word sovereignty or legislature or court, although we can make up those words, right? Algonquian languages are very good at adding new things in to their, um, their ways of reasoning. Um, but the point is that if we're a verb-based language, um, what we need to do, so, so the word for law in Anishinaabemwin is inakonage. Inakonage is to make a decision, is to be guided in making a decision. Um, Chin uh, Akonage is a great guided way of making a decision. That's what we call our constitutions, Chin Akinagewin, right? It's a guided way of making decisions. Um, I'll give you an example from Anishinaabemwin to further share this point. Um, because we're not focused on categorizations, you know, persons, places, or things that nouns do, we're focused on conjugations. Um, we have to think about our governance in that way. Our, our, our structures in that way. So our word for blueberry pie, it's a, it's a, it's a long word, which is why I've chosen it. It's chigiatwe minagoshi minabashki minasagani bito sijigani jewa bitakaji bakwejigan. That that word is our word for blueberry pie, but it actually doesn't describe the object of a pie. It describes how the pie comes about, which is an old time Frenchman. Um, putting berries between two layers of bread, spreading them around, bending over, putting it into the oven and watching those berries explode, right? So the word for blueberry pie is actually blueberry pieing, right? It's, it's an activity. And so it is with sovereignty or governance or law. It's not a, a, a category of noun, it's a category of verb. And so how we, how we do this work, if we didn't have the word sovereignty or, or governance, is we, we pull out those points that point us towards activity about how we make decisions together, how we resolve disputes together. And, you know, with all our different pronouns that we have and our locatives and different tenses, you know, these words just go on and on and on in our language. We have a lot of possibility of, of claiming the ground that is otherwise occupied by sovereignty, but we can claim it in our own linguistics. Even if we don't speak the language, we can learn about what those things are and take lessons from them. Okay, thank you, Aaron. Again, here's another local area. You mentioned about our peace and friendship treaties here on the East Coast. And in Article 5 of what they call the Mascarene Treaty, here's the quote. Uh, 
that if any Indians are injured by any of his majesty's subjects or their dependents, they shall have satisfaction and reparation made to them according to his majesty's laws, whereby whereof the Indians shall have the benefits equal to his majesty's other subjects. So how would you respond to that for interpretation? <laughs> yes. So each treaty is unique, of course, and it's formed in the context of the negotiation. And the, the, the writing of the treaty is just evidence of the treaty. The treaty is actually the oral agreement. What the writing is, is evidence of that oral agreement. So we'd want to know if there's anything in the background that gives meaning to that to written language there in English to further um, expand what the set of possibilities might be in that regard. I spent four years working with treaty elders in Saskatchewan dealing with similar clauses in the numbered treaties. These are called the peace and order clauses in the numbered treaties. And the interpretation of the elders out there, which were um, um, Dakota, Soto, uh, Cree, and uh, Anishinaabe, the interpretation was the clause like you just read was a clause for um, harmonized <coughs> justice that the people Indigenous peoples and the Crown both participate in creating a justice system together. And by doing that, um, they create the peace and order that was um, promised under the treaty. And that, that's a restorative justice um, um, emphasis that they found in their setting. And so that's how I'd start to answer that question. Um, but of course, we'd wanna hear more about the oral and the broader uh, Mi'kmaq and Wallastokwi um, contexts. Okay, thank you. Uh, another one. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, okay. Can you comment on the demand for the repeal of the Indian Act, which outlawed indigenous legal systems you described? Yeah, so in 1876, the Indian Act was passed to try to assimilate indigenous <clears throat> peoples and make them like Victorian uh, citizens of that era. And so it uh, proposed such things as uh, land can no longer be held uh, collectively. It had to be held individually. Um, you couldn't have hereditary chiefs. You had to have elected chiefs. Uh, women, uh, if they married non-Indian uh, uh, men, uh, would lose their status, whereas if women, um, ind Indigenous men married non-Indigenous women, they would gain status. So in other words, the Indian Act was designed to try to break apart the way we practice law, right? Standards, principles, of theory, criteria, um, processes, principles, resources for reasoning. Um, of course, it's had a great and significantly negative effect on Indigenous peoples, but fortunately, the Indian Act also recognized custom councils. The Indian Act has never been fully successful in getting rid of hereditary systems, although it's really harmful in many respects. And what I would hope to see is that we would have alternative means presented so that if First Nations wanted to they could opt out of the Indian Act for other set of options, you know, either under Section 35 of the Constitution or a treaty process or a legislative process, or if, if the, say, the Mi'kmaq or the, uh, others out there um, created a um, sort of a, a way of recognizing possibilities for reconciliation um, you know, through UNDRIP, that it could occur in that way. The point is um, that I think it can occur, but it has to, it has to occur with, with an option because right? some people will have a difficult time getting rid of the Indian Act after living it for 150 years, because in some cases we've internalized it and uh, it's taken seven generations to create this mess. And sometimes it's gonna take a few generations to get through it, if you see the other side. Okay, there's a couple more questions here. There's one here that says, do you incorporate courses in indigenous languages in the curriculum? We do, we have a Hulkaminam uh, law and language class that's taught um, with elders here on the South Island and my colleague, Sarah Morales, who herself is Halkaminam from the, the Cowichan First Nation. We purposely designed the degree to have Indigenous language be a part of it, even though people are coming from different parts of the country, never might never speak Halkaminam. Well, they might only just get this one class, but it's a way of respecting our local territories here. And it's also a way of signaling that, you know, don't you dare go out and think you can practice in this world of Indigenous law without registering the importance of language to it. And so that hopefully course will, will be that signal that they'll carry around with them uh, as to how a language contains a worldview 
And then when they work with other communities, other cultures, other languages, they'll see that as an important part of um, those laws. Okay, next question. What advice would you give to non-Indigenous undergrad students who are looking to get more involved with elders to learn from them and hear their stories? How would one go about getting in contact with Indigenous communities? Yeah, so most of the schools I've been associated with have first people's houses or Indigenous centers. And at those centers, um, there's often community representation or community involvement in some fashion. And uh, so here at UVic, we have elders in residence and you can make appointments and, and uh, talk with those elders and understand about where they're coming from. And then there's you know, seminars and conferences and more likely there's teas and, and lunches where you can sit and just socialize in that fashion. So, so watch on campus for where those events uh, might be. And if they're not there, there's that opportunity then to, to, to make it happen, right? Um, as, as I've explained with law degrees, incorporating Indigenous law over the last 30 years, it's because of students' efforts to bring that to the attention of administration. Um, you could have a voice in that if it's not already occurring on your campus. Okay, uh, next one. How do you feel about the progress towards reconciliation in Canada? Your lecture was positive and cited many important examples. Do you feel that a good pathway is being set? So let me just answer this question first by saying a couple of negative things. Uh, so there's 64% of the children in care in British Columbia are Indigenous children, 6-4, 64%. We might represent about 8% of the population here. So there's an over-representation of kids in care, not only in British Columbia, those numbers are much higher on the prairies, 80 to 90% of the kids in care might be Indigenous. Likewise, in the criminal justice system, um, the 80 to 90% of the people that are in provincial prisons in uh, those settings are Indigenous peoples, and they might represent about 15, 1-5% of the province uh, population. So a young Indigenous boy growing up in Saskatchewan has a greater chance of going to prison than they actually have of going to college. So, so these are out of order, right? This over-representation. You also find low rates of uh, employment compared to the non-Indigenous populations. One of the most heart heartful statistics for me is low rates of completion of post-secondary education so that people aren't going on to some of the opportunities that we're talking about this evening. So very low rates of participation and high rates of over-representation in some of these uh, uh, situations. Let's acknowledge that as even we talk positively this evening, uh, because those statistics represent real lives that are struggling mightily and are, are strained and full of trauma, quite frankly. Uh, but it's not the only thing that's going on, right? We have to have our eyes wide open to the possibilities as well as the challenges there. And I want to say in answering your question that I hope we don't make the perfect the enemy of the good. Sometimes we wait for sort of the proper, perfectly formed solution to come along before we might take action. And, and that perfect can get a, in the way of doing things that are good in the here and now and building on the good as time goes along. Um, but I am hopeful, despite the challenges and despite the fact that perfection is not around the corner. And my hope is actually grounded because I've had 30 years of experience visiting with communities, visiting with students, talking in the halls of legislatures and parliaments. And I know that things are happening. Things aren't happening in some places and I'm discouraged about that. And it, it, you know, I, it's, it's a up and down process, but there is a, a trajectory that um, is different than when my grandfather lived. And uh, I'm appreciative of those possibilities that are around us. Okay, and the final question, uh, John, is how can we start the process of educating people about Indigenous issues? I think the best process is just to start talking with folks where they are with what they're interested in, right? Uh, I read this book, I think it's called Saving Us. It's about climate justice. And I think her name is Janet Hayhoe. Just, just talk to people where they are about what they're interested in. 
Um, this isn't to be um, sort of over the top with folks, but if people are interested in jobs, you might talk about how jobs are related to this question. If people are interested in the environment, you talk about how environment is related to this question. If they're interested in the arts, you can talk about arts. If you're interested in governance, talk about governance, right? The, this, this is an area of life that cross cuts so many of our interests and we don't need to go way far outside of our interests. We just need to learn what's in our interest and what connects to our interests from these indigenous perspectives and possibilities that we've been talking about this evening. Well, thank you. Well, thank you very much, John. And I'll turn this over to uh, Dr. Uh, Shannon Brook. Well, thank you very much. What a terrific discussion, some great questions and some extremely interesting and inspiring answers. Thank you very much, uh, Chancellor Nicholas and um, Professor Boros. Well, every year we dedicate this lecture as a memorial to Dr. Abdul Qayyum Lodi, who was a professor of sociology at St. Thomas University and the first founder and director of the Atlantic Human Rights Center. Um, for his contributions to our community and in particular for his devotion to peace and understanding, acceptance and respect between all peoples. Dr. Lodi was presented with the New Brunswick Human Rights Commission uh, Award for Excellence in Human Rights in 1989. I never had the privilege of knowing Dr. Lodi myself, but it is indeed an honor to dedicate tonight's proceedings in his memory. And every year we likewise pay tribute to the outstanding contributions of one individual to the promotion of human rights. Professor John Boros was selected as this year's recipient of the Atlantic Human Rights Center Award for Excellence in Human Rights, as I'm sure you can understand the reasons why after hearing uh, his contribution this evening. So Professor Boros, we confer this award in recognition of your groundbreaking work, promoting greater understanding and integration of Indigenous law in all its forms in Canada, as is consistent with the human right to self-determination of peoples. Your work helps make real the human rights recognized in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. In particular, your work plays a crucial role supporting the human right not to be subject subjected to forced assimilation or destruction of culture, and the consequent right to practice and to revitalize cultural traditions and customs and to maintain, protect and develop future manifestations of these. This includes the right, of course, to due recognition of Indigenous peoples' laws, the right to promote, develop and maintain institutional structures and distinctive customs, traditions, procedures, practices and juridical systems or customs in accordance with international human rights standards, as you described, as well as the right to access just and fair procedures for the resolution of conflicts and disputes with states or other parties, as well as to effective remedies for all infringements of individual and collective rights with due consideration of the customs, traditions, rules, and legal systems of the Indigenous peoples concerned and international human rights. So that's uh, UN Declaration uh, of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, Articles 8, 11, 27, 34, and 40. So uh, on behalf of the Atlantic Human Rights Center, thank you so much for all you do. Uh, John, if, it, if we were in person, I would take great pleasure in handing this award directly to you. But as it is, uh, we're going to have to put it in the post and it will be delivered to you in a few days. So thank you very, very much. Thank you. It is an honor to receive this. I'm appreciative of Dr. Lodi and his work. And I looked through the lectures that have been given over the past number of years and really has created a wonderful legacy to uh, build our awareness and our action on the front of human rights. And so I will continue to walk this road as I know many of us want to as well. And it's because of people like Dr. Lodi and the Atlantic Human Rights Center uh, that we can keep our eye fixed on those goals. So thank you so much. Thank you again. And thank you to everyone involved. Thank you to all our panelists. Thank you to all um, our people doing background support. Uh, and thank you to all of you in the audience who stuck with us uh, for, for, um, this, for the duration of this event, this very interesting event. So that's it for our program. Um, thank you, everyone, and good night. <laughs>